All right, number 11 from chapter 11. It is going from isopropanol or 2-propanol. They're saying what's happening. And we want to go to, looks like, propanol, 1-propanol. From 2-propanol to 1-propanol. So how would this take place? So the first thing I would do, uh, do we add any carbons? Not adding any carbons. We, let's number our carbons. How about that? So one, two, three, and one, two, three. So it looks like the OH started out on carbon two and ends up on carbon three in the less substituted carbon. All right. So we're going to need to do a retrosynthetic analysis. So if we work backwards, we have an alcohol on the less substituted carbon. What starting material would that come from? Now I'll call the less substituted carbon. Uh, pi bond where? Between two and three. Very good. Do you know how to make a alkene from an alcohol, a secondary alcohol? Elimination. An elimination, right? We can go right from here. All right, that's what we've been talking about. Taking an activated alcohol and doing elimination. Right? Remember, we've been doing that though. We can't do the elimination. Remember the leaving group hierarchy? Right? So if we want to do an elimination, we can't use HBr, HCl, or HI. We have to use what for our reagents going forward? H2SO4. H2SO4. Very good. That'll get us to the alkene. And then if I want to get the anti-Markovnikov product, the alcohol, the OH on the less substituted carbon, what do I need to do? The BH3. The BH3. And they separate this out. BH3 is one step. And then they want you to do the H2O2. OH minus in the second step. So they separate out as two things. But you could always say it's just one for me. It's fine. So number 12. Hold on one second. I'm doing this one now. It's about this one. Okay, let's just go through the mechanism. A little heat, strong acid, H plus, same as concentrated. These guys are going to find each other. What's the first step going to be? What's my electrophile? What's my nucleophile? What's my electrophile? H. All right. Anytime you have strong acid, it's pretty safe to say that's going to be your electrophile. So whatever else has to be your nucleophile. In this case, what's going to be my nucleophile? Lone pairs on? Oxygen. Yes. What kind of alkyl halide do we have here? Secondary alkyl, not alkyl halide, excuse me. Secondary alkyl leaving group. So... We know that if we have water as a leaving group, can we form a carbocation? Yes. yes. Why can we form a carbocation here? Secondary. And water is such a good leaving group, right? Not because it's secondary. We can do it because water is such a good leaving group. Water is such a stable leaving group. So we'll do a carbocation here. Right. Right. So secondary alkyl leaving groups with water, we can do straight up carbocation. Straight up. And this is the rate determining step, right? Because forming a carbocation takes a lot of energy to make happen. At this point, you should have already done this before, but you should have been numbering your carbons. Yep, it's totally overrated. No, no, it's not. Nope, no, it's not. Secondary carbocation, can we make this a more stable carbocation? How are we going to do that? Not a hydride shift, a methyl shift, yep. So show those two electrons moving. So where is the plus charge at now? Carbon three, four, five, three, two, one, six. Very good. They didn't say this, but H plus is a catalyst here. Plus. They're not really telling you you have any, I mean, you have water. Water could attack. You can make the alcohol again. But I think, right, you should be thinking about elimination. Why would it be, why would it be good to do an elimination here? What, what, what beta hydrogen, why is it more, why is it really a stable product? Four substituted. Tetra substituted. Yep, four substituted, or tetra substituted. So what, what beta hydrogen are we going to take off from this? Which carbon? The H on two, that's right. And we just show those electrons going there. And that gets us to our final alkene product.
five, six, two, one. Yeah. Number one. Number one. Yeah, just take us way back. Oh, you want to, not in this, you're okay with this? I'm okay with that. Is, is, there, exactly like that. is everybody else okay with this right now? Yeah. Yep, okay. All right, so number one had a similar problem to the one we just did. HBR, right? So the first step again, lone pair attacks. All right, we get BR minus. Secondary alkyl leaving group. Carbocation is certainly on the board. It's going to happen. Everything's the same. Plus charge. We finally know where our carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do that methyl shift. Okay. Plus charge on carbon three, just like before. One, two, six, three, four, five. Only difference here now is we have Br- in solution. Before we just had H+, and I guess water is around, but water is not a very good nucleophile, right? So remember we talked about things that aren't very good nucleophiles, right? And if they, they're in the hierarchy of leaving groups, things that were higher up on the thing, the well, hierarchy, higher up on the hierarchy, weren't very good nucleophiles. They were more likely to act as bases. But things on the bottom, like iodine, bromine, and chlorine, more act, likely to act like nucleophiles, right? If I want to add a bromine, I use HBr, right? But if I wanted to do an elimination, I'd use the H2SO4. So this is acting as a nucleophile, not a base. That's right. Now it's going to act like a nucleophile, so it'll be like an SN1 reaction, right? Yeah. SN1. There you go. So, <laughs> number 13... Number 13 is propanol, propanol, and they're using K2CrO7 and H2SO4. So the key here is, right, what I showed you guys in class was anytime you saw chromium, right, right, if you see chromium, that's a really strong oxidizing agent, right? So they're going to show you chromium in lots of different ways. K2CrO7, H2CrO7, CrO3, H, I don't know. <laughs> Anytime you see chromium, you know that's a really strong oxidizing agent. And that means for every alpha CH there is, you will get a new CO bond. So in this case, how many alpha CHs are there? If I number these carbons, one, two, three. Which, which carbon is the alpha carbon, first of all? Three, right? Alpha, beta carbon, right? Remember, we've been talking a lot about the beta carbons, right, for eliminations. Now we're talking about the alpha carbons. How many alpha carbons on three? I mean, how many alpha hydrogens on three? Two. two. So if I have two there, how many of those guys can I turn into, can I turn into C, CO bonds? Two. So if I was this, I'm going to full, I'm going to stop along the way. I'm going to do a quick pit stop here as an aldehyde, but I'm going to keep on reacting, right? Turns out aldehydes are pretty reactive, and I'm going to end up with <coughs> getting rid of that and making a carboxylic acid. That's so my what final product. Just a primary. This, so th this is a primary alcohol. A primary carbon, though. So, has so what if I had, yeah, what if I had just, say, methanol? Right. right how, many, how many alpha CHs does methanol have? Oh, three. Three. So what's it going to be? It's going to be carbonic acid. Right? It's going to be C double bond O. 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 Well, think about it. So let's slow down. How many alpha CHs does methanol have? Three. One, two, three. So for every alpha CH bond, we're going to make a bond to oxygen. How many new bonds of oxygen did I add to this carbon? I added one, two, three. One for one, two, three. How come it doesn't do carbon add? Why is it 
it, it, it turns, it's because it's in acidic media, so it goes to carboxylic acid. Yep. So for every alpha CH bond, we get a new CO bond. Right? So in this case up here, we have two alpha CHs. So we're going to make one new CO bond and another CO bond. If we're in methanol, we're going to add, we have three, one, two, three alpha CHs. So we need to add one, two, three CO bonds. Does that make sense? What is the H2SO4? Okay. It's just in strong acid. So I haven't shown you the mechanism for this yet. <coughs> That's what's going to protonate this to get it to be a carboxylic acid. Okay. So I can show you the mechanism if you want me to. Hold on a second. I'll do the mechanism next. The mechanism for this oxidation with chromium, I'm going to show you now. You start out with usually it's... So you need metal. Metal is chromium's a metal. Is that like completely? Yep, that's a really high oxidation state metal. That's chromium six, right? So chromium six. So that's pretty high oxidation state. So it really wants electrons. It's pretty delta plus. It's chromium six plus right now. Why doesn't like iron oxide? Well, so iron. Look at look at our irons at the periodic table. So iron, iron will make iron oxides, right? But it won't go to iron six. So different oxidation states as you get to the left of the periodic table. So chromium has six valence electrons, and in just the way, essentially the way its orbitals line up, it's much more willing to, to be oxidized than iron would be. It's a little in-depth in organic chemistry. I don't want to go too far in that direction. But things on the left side of the periodic table are much more willing to be oxidized, right? Think about like sodium is willing to be Na+. Right? So chromium is kind of the, the last line where things are really going to be highly oxidized. I mean, you can get iron oxides too, but not like this, not like this. So you have chromium 6 plus, right? And you'll see this in lots of ways, right? You'll see that last one we just looked at, K2CrO7, right? If you add H, if you just replace the potassiums with H's, you get this. So what's the first step is going to happen? The oxygen is going to attack the chromium because it's pretty delta plus, right? When it does that, let's say it kicks out an OH. <sighs> Whatever, that's fine. <laughs> well, let's say it doesn't, uh, sure, let's say it kicks out the OH. So there'd be a plus charge here. This may or may not be the whole truth. And you've made OH minus, right? So what do you think that OH minus is going to do? Attack where? The hydrogen on the... There. Right. There may be a better way to do this, but this is okay for right now. Either way... This is good, you should know this. It's on video, it's recording, so you can look back on it later. And we've made water. All right, so at this point, this is all great. Let us not forget what the point of this all was again. What was chromium going to do? What does chromium do? It's an oxidizing agent. Where is it? What does it do? It takes, it adds oxygen bonds. What bonds does it have to break? On which carbon hydrogen? Alpha, not beta. These guys. All right, so we know we need to remove one of these H's, right? At the end of the day, that's, that's part of the goal here is to get rid of both those H's, but I'm just going to show you the first one. So what has to happen is actually, right, the chromium, where's all the electron density? Is it on the chromium, do you think, or on the oxygens? So imagine these electrons, this pi bond, go and grab that oxygen. Hydrogen, that's what I said. I said oxygen. I meant hydrogen. Lies. And at the same time, those two electrons go there. 
and the chromium gets back the other two electrons. So now what has happened? We've made an aldehyde. We've made an aldehyde. And we've made, let's see, our chromium has an OH here now. There's another OH. And that. So we went from chromium 6 to chromium 4, right? See how it now it has 4 bonds? And it got 2 electrons back, so now it's chromium 4. Right? So it's not as reactive now. <coughs> and then this whole process repeats itself again, right? Where this oxygen now attacks the chromium, and this guy takes that last H. Actually, this is a little different. This last step is a little different. Sorry, I take that back. I forgot about this step. So this step is the this is the first step to make the aldehyde, but we're not done yet. Everybody okay up to this point of us taking this, having an attack the chromium, kick out the OH minus, making water. Having the pi electrons take that H, making the new pi bond, making chromium four now. So chromium got chromium got reduced. This carbon got oxidized, right? So every time you do a reduction, oxidation reduction, right? Something gets oxidized, then somebody else has to be reduced, right? Electrons don't disappear. Right? If some right, in every redox reaction, right, is essentially an electrophile and nucleophile reaction. Somebody wants electrons. Somebody's giving up electrons. Right, so in this case, the chromium got reduced. This carbon got oxidized. Right, the, you can see the chromium. Look at the, you can see the chromium getting the electrons. You can see the oxygen losing the electrons. See that? Okay. Now it gets a little more complicated. Do you have to activate that? Nope. The chromium activates itself. The chromium is reactive enough because it's six plus that the oxygen is going to attack it. The alcohol. So everybody's with me now to this point. I'm gonna we're gonna bring in some more chromium, the good stuff, chromium six, the really reactive stuff, and that water is still along for the ride. Who's in biochem? Anybody in biochem? Perfect. You'll learn some biochem-ish stuff. So aldehydes are pretty reactive. It turns out an aldehyde will even react with Water. The carbon of the aldehyde, the carbon of the carbonyl is pretty delta plus, right? If you think about it, it's double bond to that oxygen. So if water attacks that carbon and I make that bond, I also must break the pi bond. So what does that give me? It gives me something called a tetrahedral intermediate, which we'll talk a lot more about. Oh, yeah. Get something like this. All right. So we can say PT for proton transfer, and that's just an easy way for us to say, I'm going to move this hydrogen up here and just balance the charges out. So PT, we can balance our charges out. And now we have this, call this an acetal. You'll see hemiacetals or hemiketals in sugar chemistry. So we have this dial, right? This dial. So this carbon, right? Essentially, if you look at a ketone or an aldehyde, how many bonds to car oxygen does this carbon have? Two. How many bonds to carbon or oxygen does this carbon have? Two. So we didn't change oxidation states, did we? We just changed it from a pi and a sigma to two sigma bonds, right? So, yep. So far, so good. What did I forget, Blake? I messed something up. What did I forget? Yeah. I need that hydrogen there, right? Again, if there's no alpha H, can I do an oxidation? Yeah. No. So there has to be that alpha H there. Okay? So if you're buying me doing all that. So now, how do you think this is going to react with the chromium? 
if I, if I drew the chromium here, let's say the oxygen attacks the chromium, kicks out that OH. What's the PT? Proton transfer. So all that's saying is this H, or this H, which one, <coughs> gets attacked by another molecule. Just move, proton transfers happen all the time. Okay. Move fast. Just to balance the charge out, so there's no charges. So the chromium gets attacked. What do we got? We have an OH up here, an H right here, an OH plus charge, chromium, and we made OH minus. So the OH minus takes the H off there. And we made water. Right, and now again, same kind of step. Oops, I keep forgetting. I'm sorry. Yep, the chromium still has that double bond there to that. Still six plus. Again, the pi bond attacks. These electrons go there. Electrons go back to the chromium. I will. I'll slow down. So let's slow down. So once we get this diol, which is just the water attacking the aldehyde and the proton transfer, we get to this. All right? This oxygen again attacks that same chromium from the beginning. All right? This is like H2Cr07 or O4. Right? Attacks there, kicks out the OH minus. So it's exactly the same as before. The OH minus can get kicked out, takes the H from the oxygen that attacked, right? And then once we get here, that pi bond on the oxygen of chromium takes that H. These electrons between that CH bond, the alpha CH bond, form that new pi bond, and then the electrons go back to the chromium. So what you end up with is a carboxylic acid water, and then another chromium, right, where that new, right, this H right here is this H right here. The alpha H is also this H. That's where this oxygen took it and end up there in that OH. One of the double bonds took it, one of the pi bonds took it. Right, this pi bond right here, these two electrons took that H, that ended up right there. Yep. This carbon got oxidized, the chromium got reduced. Right? The chromium is getting electrons. The oxygen is losing electrons. The carbon is losing electrons. Right? For every oc oxidation, somebody has to get reduced. All right, I need to re, re, re fix something I said before. So, number 15 in sampling. Gives the example with methanol, and I just got done saying how this is going to turn into how many alpha CHs does it have? So if there's chromium around, how many alpha CHs are there? Three. So in reality, I, what I told everybody, what I said in the last problem, that it was that it would turn into carbonic acid. The problem with this, and I wonder if they would accept this in the answer, this will actually break down further into CO2 and water, right, where this H is this H, and this OH is this OH. So yeah, it, it could keep breaking down into carboxy, carbon dioxide and water, but would they want, and I wonder if they would just give this answer correct. Okay. Check, check and see if they give you CO2 and water, if it would work. But they want you to stop it at essentially this and leave one H still intact. This is the answer Sapling wants. But if it does keep reacting, it would break. I mean, this is possible. CO2 and water is what you'd make if it kept reacting. 
So they give, if you put CO2, they give it to you? It says product. So I'm thinking that it's going to be wrong. Just draw CO2, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Oh, got it. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. So CO2 works. This would work and this would work. By God, there's more than one right answer. Science. Well, this is like a further oxidation, right? It first goes to the aldehyde, then to this, and then it would keep going to this, which would eventually break down to these. So, good question. So, number 19 is one of those grand old retro synthetic problems. So we start off with bromocyclopentane, and we need to get to the epoxide. We need the epoxide. So the first question um, we ask ourselves, how do we make epoxides? We know two ways to make epoxides. We can either make epoxides from what kind of star materials? What are the two types of star materials? Alkenes or or OH and PB and BR, right? That SN2. So it's either alkenes and MCPBA or the OH and bromine on opposite sides. So if I look at this, this is one of those ones where you put the things in the in the bins. I see that there's no MCPBA, and if there's no MCPBA, I know it. I can only make the epoxide the other way. So what? What would this have? What would this epoxide had to have come from then? If it can't come from an alkene, it had to come from BROH, BROH. and that BR and OH will need to be trans to each other, right? Yes, they will. Right to do that SN two. No, they don't show the serochemistry, but we know better. Right? So if we're having, how do I get a bromine and OH on, what kind of star material do a bromine and OH come from? Alkene. Alkene. So it's just, you have a, it's just what base you chose. It's the only thing. This alkene can come from this alkyl halide, right? Okay. Moving forward now. What kind of reaction? We have a secondary alkyl halide. <coughs> what kind of rea and we want to turn it into an alkene. What kind of reaction can we do? Can we do a, what, what, what kind are we going to do for sure? Has to be what? Has to be an elimination. E1 or E2? Can it be E1? No, don't forget, right? Only that water leaving group can we do the secondary alkyl leaving groups with a carbocation. Is bromine a good enough leaving group to form a carbocation? No, so it has to be an E2. And if we're going to do an E2, what kind of base should we use? Uh, Strong. Um, How about size? Big. big, right? Because otherwise it would possibly do an SN2. So the options that you have there, one of them, the bases is tert butoxide. I think it's K+. Plus. All right, so a big bulky base. Good, that gets you an E2. What reagents will add a bromine and a water? Yeah. Or Br2 in water, yeah, in water. Good. And then we need a base to deprotonate, to deprotonate that OH, or the H on the oxygen. So we don't want to use the big base again, because otherwise we might do another E2. So we actually want to use the NaOH minus, right? OH minus is usually a better base than it is nucleophile. Right? So it deprotonates there, SN2 gets you to the product. Uh, what do you say? NaH. Yep, sodium hydride you could use as well. That's what we use a lot before. The NaH. They didn't show you that here. Though. But you don't want to use the big bulky base because you might do an elimination instead. I would, if you would have put the big bulky base there, I'd probably have been fine with it on the test. All right, number 18. This is a really good one. I like this problem a lot. This is a so this is a little different than we've been doing because this has uh, an ether we're going to activate actually not an alcohol we're actually going to activate an ether here very similar though so what are we going to do we're going to activate ether so 
attack HI here. So now we've activated the ether, and we also have I minus round. Good. <laughs> so if you look at this, um, this ether essentially, oh, I don't know, we could say on either side of the ethers, right? So it's going to be a little more challenging, right? In alcohol, we can look at, where we only have to look at one side, it's attached to only one carbon. So we can say it's a primary alkyl leaving group, a primary alcohol secondary. And ether, we got to actually look at both sides. So it's number one and two. So which carbon do you think is more likely to get attacked, one or two? Right, if we're going to do an SN2 reaction here, I don't know if we, we could do an E2. We could do an E2, but I'm thinking maybe SN2, right? Primary alcohols or primary ethers. Which one do you want to attack, one or two? It actually doesn't matter, really, I don't think. But I would probably attack one, actually, because one's a special kind of primary carbocation, or primary carbon. One is benzylic. So you attack there. Now, I think sapling should take if you attack two as well. We'll still give it, I'll get the answers. I think it should take it. Somebody have to check. Well, you have to give an A and a B. Yeah, an A and a B. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think it'll go... But then either way, you can get there, I think. So this is one way. So one of the organic products we have would be the, I, the benzylic iodide. Benzyl iodide. We also made the alcohol. But now the alcohol could keep reacting, right? They're basically saying whatever part you decided to have the alcohol could keep reacting with more HI. Right, they're saying concentrate HI for the reaction. So A is the... So this could be A. Okay. But I want somebody to try doing it the other way. Somebody try doing it so you have iodine attack carbon 2 and see if it still works and make benzyl alcohol. It should still work. It should still get the same answer. Yeah. Make benzyl alcohol B and make ethyl iodide A. I'll show the other way you can do it in a second. Activate this alcohol. So now we have a primary alkyl leaving group. Are we going to do E1 or SN1? No. So again, we're going to do an SN2. And that get us to I, ethyl iodide, and then water for the final part. So this would have been... B, and this would be C. But I think you could do it the other way as well. Right? So the other way would involve having the I minus attack 2, making the benzyl alcohol, and just doing all that same stuff with the benzyl alcohol. I don't think it would matter. So I guess I would, I would say that it does have to, iodine does have to attack carbon 1, just because, because carbon 1 is benzylic, it's going to be more reactive. It's going to be more delta plus. So an iodine has to go there. A, A is this. No, 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 no. I'm looking at it. So looking at number 21, essentially it's, this one's going to be about epoxides. And so I'm going to modify this a little bit just to help us. Make it more complicated than it is. In this case, we have an epoxide, and in epoxide chemistry, we have to look at two things. So an epoxide is usually a pretty good electrophile. At least the carbons of the epoxide are good electrophiles. So epoxides will react differently whether they're an acid or strong base or strong or negative charges or plus charges. So right now they're in negative charges, right? This is a negative charge. Overall we have a negative charge. When we have an overall negative charge, when you have to pick which carbon to attack, the most important factor is sterics. So, negative charge, sterics is the most important. Meaning, you're going to attack the carbon that's 
the least sterically hindered. So the carbon that has the least other carbons on it. So if I number these 1 and 2, which one's the least sterically hindered? 1. Right? And again, it's going to be an SN2 type reaction. Right? So what happens here, we have O minus. The wedges and hatches don't have to change at all. Right, so we went for the least sterically hindered carbon. Notice the things are trans. I think in this one what they'll have set up, they'll have another methanol or methanol solvent hanging out here. And this oxygen is going to grab that to get protonated. And I don't think the problem has the wedges and hatches. I've just added those to, to, for us to understand again. This is an SN2. Now there's an OH. And you've remade the nucleophile as well. And that's what we're looking for the final product. So in negative charges with epoxides, negative charges, it's all about sterics. You go to the less substituted carbon. In acidic conditions, it's going to be different. So this is basic conditions, they call it, negative charges. The overall negative charge, we're worried about sterics, least substituted carbon. In acid, in H+, right, we're going to, it's going to be the opposite. We're actually going to go for the most substituted carbon. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So let's take that same exact example. Like this. And now it's going to be a little different. We're going to have... Oh, it's going to be in methanol. I don't like the way they drew it. And I'm going to say it's in H+, or H2SO4. It doesn't matter. This is like number 24. Like 24. This is like 24, but I've, I've, I've made some changes. So. so this is going to be a little different, because what if I told you guys about H+. What is H+, an electrophile or a nucleophile? It's an electrophile. It's an electrophile. So where is the nucleophile going to be at in this case? It's actually going to be on the epoxide. The lone pairs on the oxygen and the epoxide are actually going to be the nucleophile. Right, because that's why I keep harping on you guys. Right, If you see H+, that's going to be an electrophile. Use the H plus as an electrophile. Make that happen first. If you see H plus, use it. So why did we do this? This kind of leads into stuff we're going to talk about in the future. But by putting that, uh, that hydrogen on the oxygen, what, did that, what do you think that did to carbons 1 and 2? To that bond? What do you think that did it make that oxygen happy? Having that plus, or does that make that oxygen happy? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to make that oxygen pull even more on carbons one and two? Yes. yes. Now the question is, which carbon, one or two, can handle the delta plus the best? Which one can handle delta plus the best? The more, the more substituted one, right? Why? Because of hypergonification. Oh right? So in plus charge <coughs> environments... Go to more crowded C2 in this case, right? Because C2 can handle the delta plus better, right? This is a little different. Now it's not about the sterics. It's about well, which carbon, right, between 1 and 2 is going to be the most delta plus. 2 is just because it can handle it better because it's more substituted. So which carbon is actually going to get attacked? In this case, it's not going to be 1. It's going to be 2. Can you draw that h uh, I like to do it this way. Don't lose, your, don't lose hydrogens along the way. OH. And also sapling probably won't take it, but there's still an H there. O, H is still there, plus charge, oxygen. And then the final step, H plus is actually a catalyst here. So we have the hydrogen leave, right? So this is a cat.
common mistakes people will make? What do you think the common mistakes are people are going to make with this? What do you think the common mistakes will be? To add carbon one. To add carbon one, right? Forget which one, right? In plus charges, it's about being more crowded, actually, because you can handle the plus charge better. What else are we going to make? There's also another mistake. I don't know why people do this, but they do this all the time. This is a, oh, I lost, well, first of all, I've lost a carbon. Thank you very much. That's what they do. That's what people will do. They'll either lose a carbon like I just did for a second, or they'll decide to break this CO bond and make this an OH. I've never understood that. So they get confused when, when you're asking about breaking this at the same time. People start getting doing weird things. All of a sudden, what well, should be an ether becomes an alcohol. And it's like, what happened to those carbons? So be careful. Or all of a sudden, it'll attach from this carbon, it'll attach to that carbon, the OH will be the end. So be careful. All right, what's attacking what? 